Hearts of Iron 4 Combat Statistics. That's these things found within the Division Template Editor for your Army Divisions. And so, without any delay, let's go ahead on into the game and we'll crack these things open one at a time. So I'm currently in a war with Poland, you can ignore that. We'll come over to the Division Template here, we'll take a look at it. I've just picked an Infantry Division. We'll go through some of these and modify some as needed. So the first statistic here is the maximum speed. Now this is the maximum speed for the entire division. Remember each division is signified by each one of these figurines. There is no possible way in the game that you can split the division off into two different directions or say right the, the, the faster units go this way, the slower guys, uh, you know, you join us tomorrow, whatever it is. The whole division sticks together. So if we come over to the Division Designer, let's go ahead and create a new division. If we think, all right, well, actually, Germany 39, you know, they've got pretty fast light tanks. I'm just using the vanilla version of the game here. See the fast tanks there, 14 and a half kilometers an hour. So if we go ahead, put another one in, speed stays the same. If we now create an infantry battalion to join the division, that speed drops to four, which means these tanks will always travel at four kilometers per hour. So using your template designer, be careful what units you mix with what, otherwise you may negate a lot of the uh, bonuses that speed would otherwise give you. Next one to look at. Bum, bum, bum. Here we go, is hit points. All right, hit points are intrinsically linked with the ability for a unit to defend itself. The two play a close role together. So when it comes to attacking a unit, I realize, hang on, we were talking about hit points here, yeah. But uh, when a unit is attacking another unit, that unit has to defend itself. As we attack that enemy unit, there is a 10% chance every time we attack the unit that we take off some of its hit points and again this goes for soft and hard they're two different types of attack so let's just focus on soft attack for the infantry for this example however the infantry is obviously able to defend itself in this case it's got 314 defenses per hour okay so each one of these statistics is reset on an hourly basis so if we're able to uh, attack this infantry unit and that infantry unit is able to defend itself 314 times in one hour bearing in mind every time we do that there's a 10% chance that we damage the unit in other words there is a 10% chance we knock off its hit points however once we get through the defensive capabilities of the division in other words if we attack it 315 times per hour suddenly our ability to cause damage to this unit jumps from 10% up to 40%, which means roughly every two and a half attacks we carry out, we're able to inflict damage on the unit or its hit points, its health. Attacking a unit's health or hit points results directly in organizational loss as well as the hit point loss on the unit. And that translates into manpower loss, equipment loss. Basically, we're killing people, right? That's what's going on. So the higher the hit points is, obviously, the longer a unit is able to sustain damage. But in an ideal world, we, the unit would be better able to defend itself so that we're less likely to inflict damage on the health or the hit points of the units in the first place. So I hope that clears that one up. And again, hit points... Once that reaches zero, the division is entirely destroyed. What makes up the hit points is the sum of all of the battalions within. So if we were to come into the editor, for example, let's just pick the existing infantry division. If you take a look on hit points here, if we add a new infantry battalion onto there, which is a thousand men, take a look at those hit points, takes a big increase. Yeah, you've got more men. Basically, there's more stuff to kill before... It's wiped out, which is a kind of a morbid way of looking at it. But again, this is a war simulator. Okay, so the next one, let's carry on then. Organization. Okay, you may have heard this. Other people said this, and it is true. Every time there is a battle between two divisions, and let's uh, give our fictitious one-on-one 
kind of example. He who runs out of organization first will lose the fight. Or at least they will stop fighting first, which may or may not be seen as losing the fight. There are, of course, exceptions to that. So let me show you, for example, a real quick reason why not necessarily losing organization first means you lose. If I create a new division and I'm going to put in here uh, some heavy tanks, put in some medium tanks... And then we'll come over here, we'll put in some light tanks all the way. And then we'll come over here, we'll even, we'll add in a couple of motorized divisions on there. We'll even come on to the ends and put in some artillery. Okay, there we go. Take a look at this one, organization 26.9. That's kind of atrociously poor, even though we see we've got a real nice pick and mix of units there. That's an expensive division to produce with this. Well over 5,000 industrial capacity to knock one of these divisions out. Not to mention we're to almost 7,000 men at this moment in time. But what I really want you to focus on is the ability of the soft attack. 170 odd as well as the organization. Let's call it 27. 170 soft attack, 27 organization. Now I'm going to create a new division and I'm just going to put one infantry battalion in there. There we go. Look at the organization there. If we were to save this, this has got an organization of 75, which is like three times higher than the division that we just created. However, look at the ability of soft attack. It's abysmal. Uh, the ability for this division to defend itself is not entirely great either. Only 30 defenses per hour. The division we just created had 270 attacks per hour. So 240 of those attacks uh, are going to have a high percent... Uh, or a 40% chance of causing this division damage. In other words, over 100 or around 100 attacks every hour will inflict damage on this particular division. So despite this division having the higher organization in that one-on-one -on -one, uh, example we gave there, because every time our, the stronger division attacks this division and it's a successful hit, don't forget this division will not only lose hit points, this one here, it will lose organization very quickly as well. So yes, there is a high organization, but we would chip away at that organization so quickly, even though the other template had a lower organization to begin with. So does organization matter? Yes, it is directly how long a, a unit can fight for, but it is not isolated in a bubble yet. Yeah, we can knock away at a, at, a, at a division's organization by inflicting damage upon that organization. Another way that I like to describe organization, certainly for the tutorials I've been running here on the channel, is it's analogous to how tired units are, how much sleep they need. If organization is low, your divisions are tired, they need sleep, they need rest. If organization is high, they're raring to go. The quickest way to instantly kill from high organization to low organization is to set a division training. And that's obvious, right? Divisions running around an assault course... That may be good for training purposes, but if the enemy attacks while they're running around the assault course, they're caught with their pants down. In other words, the division is very low and they will get shredded as a consequence. Okay, next one, recovery rate. This also refers directly with organization and is just how quickly a division can recover. That There are all sorts of modifiers in this game, uh, general traits, uh, different sort of organizations, field marshals, um, military doctrines and so forth, as well as any modifiers that you may have nationally. But when it comes to moving around such as this, there will be a small loss of organization every hour. I believe it's 0 0.2 or 0 0.02 organization loss for every hour the division's on the move. Makes sense, right? Guys are wandering around, at some point they're going to get tired. Guys fighting on the front line, they're going to lose organization. At some point, they're going to get tired. However, infantry units that are not fighting and not moving increase organization. In other words, let's come back to it. The recovery rate of that division every hour trickles or increases the overall division's organization. Makes sense, right? They're sat there not doing anything. They're resting. Uh, the tiredness is going to recover. 
And again, the various modifiers that will impact that, you can hover your mouse over and see exactly what differences each one of those things make. And as you see, they're having different units within the division are going to impact the recovery rate at different speeds. And that is averaged out over the entire division. Yeah. So in this example, we see, for example, having engineer in this example, we see, for example, I'm good at this, aren't I? Not. Uh, the engineering company there, plus 0.3 recovery, although the support artillery is plus 0.1. And so if it was only those two things, the averaged out ability of the entire division would be 0.2. And so it's not like, oh, well, the engineer company will work and the artillery won't. It doesn't go like that. The entire thing is averaged out. Next one, reconnaissance. Okay, this is one of these that can be as simple or as complicated as you like. In the very simplest form, having reconnaissance is recon trucks, right? Or horseback, or you can even have armoured uh, reconnaissance. So if you get the, the, some of the DLC, you can even use aircraft to do this. But the upshot is you get to see, in this case, we're playing uh, versus Poland. We get to see what Poland is doing across the border. We get to see how many divisions they have and where they are. And in this case, most of them are infantry. There we see cavalry. There's another cavalry and so forth. So that's the very basic way. The higher reconnaissance you have or the higher level of reconnaissance you have, the further away from the front line you'll be able to see what they're doing. However, there is more to it than just that. So if we click on one of these uh, action stations or battle stations, in this particular battle here uh, taking place near Poznan, we see... We've got three divisions currently fighting, that's these three, as well as one in reserve, and we're up against a solitary enemy division. Now, our guy, our commander in this case, or in this particular battle, is Manstein. The enemy actually doesn't have a commander in place at the minute. Now, because we have the highest reconnaissance or higher reconnaissance ability than the enemy, and not that we know that just inherently, but we do if we take a look at this combat screen, we actually get this little uh, Intel Advantage icon here, which almost always gives us this little initiative. Uh, you see these little uh, chevrons uh, wiggling up and down there through the central portrait. Now, that may... Only one side can have those initiative at either time. And again, it's almost always whoever's got the Intel Advantage. Now, if the other guy's got really good commander and you've got really bad commander... Um, the good commander in some sometimes makes up for it. But when it comes to the initiative then... Okay, so hang on, we've gone from recon to initiative. The reason is, this is why it matters, the second reason is not only do we see further behind the front line, but we're more likely to gain the initiative for that reason. Having more initiative means when it comes to attacking and defending, every 12 hours the commanders pick a tactic. In this case... I'm very early in the game. The commanders don't really have any experience yet. We've just got a straightforward attack uh, uh, command being chosen here. You know, you've got the um, the various ones. Elastic, Defense, uh, Breakthrough. I, I can't remember all the names of all the various tactics in this game. But in this case, he's just chosen a very basic one. Plus, this gives us an additional 5%. However, the enemy has come up with a defending tactic which makes what they're doing... 5% better. That, if you like, is a counter to what we're doing. Having the higher initiative, in this case our guys, means we actually get to choose second which tactic to use. Now you may think, well wouldn't it be best if you can choose first? No, because every, every tactic in this game has its counter tactic. And so if you come up with a tactic that gives you an advantage and then the enemy counters that tactic, they're able to nullify whatever advantages you may have. So if you let them pick a tactic first and then you go second, you can counter their tactic. And who gets to go second is dependent on this chevron, which in one little isolated battle may not sound like much, but when you consider that these bonuses only get bigger, the more skilled your generals and field marshals get through the course of the war, being able to use your advantages and prevent the other guy from using their advantages is a huge bonus and having a higher level of intelligence um, when it comes to... <laughs> I don't mean how smart you are, of course. I'm talking about the reconnaissance here. Uh, 
talking about intelligence and I'm making a fool of myself. Okay, next one down then, supply use. This, how many supplies are your divisions using? It makes sense, right? If you are designing a division such as this Panzer Division, uh, it's currently using 1.11 supply per day. I think it's I think it's a daily consumption, um, or it could be hourly. It doesn't really matter. But at the end of the day, the supply is 1.11. Like many units in this game, it, it just is. And so the more stuff you stick in there, the more supplies it's going to use. So let's put in a heavy tank 1.43. Now, if I was to change the heavier tank over to a lighter tank, that's 1.33. Clearly, right, the bigger tanks use more stuff. And you can imagine different support companies modify this as well. So, for example, uh, if we stick in support artillery, look, it goes from 133 to 149. However, if we use support anti-tank, it goes to 141 instead of 149. Why is that, you ask? Well, I guess the anti-tank divisions reckon they're going to use less stuff than regular support artillery. That's why. We need to be able to supply the divisions with everything that they need. And if you switch over to the F4 view, which is supply, you get this uh, color-coded view together with all the supply hubs which link from your capital. Although this isn't really a tutorial on supply, I just want to go over a couple of the uh, more obvious things. Light blue colors that you see here, there is loads of supply left, way more than you need. This darker blue is still plenty of supply left over. It's not kind of the insane levels as the light blue, but there's certainly nothing to worry about. If you see over actually on each individual tile, you can see there's a certain amount of supply left in each province. However, you find a color such as this, this sort of purplish color. There is still no shortage, but if you take a look how much supply is left in the region, 0.09, what it's saying is we're stretched to the limit. Everything's okay, but we won't be able to take any more divisions in this area. And we can see there's something else like that over here. So if you were planning more divisions in that area, you would have to look at upgrading the transport networks or the supply in some way. Why it matters if you run out of supply or you're not able to supply the units or, or the division to the full requirements, you will actually take a hit in terms of organization and by extension their ability to fight and fight well supply use includes the obvious things um as as manpower uh, equipment as well as the not so obvious things um i mean fuel is another obvious one but there are some less obvious things such as ammunition and food although the game doesn't simulate that um in in any great detail, the fact is it is simulated just within that supply use figure. And so as long as there's a connection to the capital and you meet the supply requirements, uh, it's all good. Average reliability, average reliability bonus is the next one. Currently, the division that I'm looking at here, this infantry division is 88.6%. And again, if we hover over, we can see sort of what differences uh, are made up there. I don't think actually... The nine infantry divisions give us 800% reliability. Rather, I think each division uh, or each battalion within there gives us a certain uh, number. Let's just uh, see that that is the case. In any case, <laughs> I can't actually see the stat on a battalion, but battalion, battalion basis. But you can see average reliability overall 88.6%. The higher the reliability is, the less likely equipment is to break down. When equipment breaks down, it's um, almost for sure to wind up as attrition. In other words, you're just going to lose it. It's going to get written off. The more equipment you lose, the more that's written off, the more the equipment needs to be replaced from the capital. So in other words, you need more factories working overtime to fulfill that attrition. But not only that... The division, while it's waiting for that new equipment to arrive, is therefore not fulfilled when it comes to supply, which means its organisation and so on takes a hit as well. So it's absolutely imperative to keep divisions as well supplied as possible, and a huge part of that is average reliability. The biggest way to change this, aside from upgrading technology over the years and researching newer technologies, is by hiring a... Uh, let's take a look here the maintenance company. So if we just going to click on this, get it uh, sorted. So if we come over here to support company and over here, 
maintenance company. I'm just going to select that to get it done. I've, I've enabled a cheat for the purposes of this video to demonstrate. So if we come over here and select one of these Panzer guys, come over to the template here. This would be an example of a division that you may consider adding maintenance company to. It's not really worth adding a maintenance company if you have a small division because they're unlikely to take many losses anyway. But if you have a large division, especially if they're using expensive um, equipment like lots of medium and heavy tanks, that would be the perfect idea uh, or example there to put in a maintenance company. So if you take a look here, reliability, bo reliability bonus, getting that first level of uh, tech there gives us a 5% bonus. And again, that stacks across everything within the division, which of course includes uh, non-Panzer-like things, you know, it could, artillery and everything else has a reliability uh, percentage. So that is a good thing to have. Not only that, it helps to capture enemy equipment. By default, uh, we're jumping around a little bit on this one, the enemy equipment capture ratio is zero. There are only two ways to capture enemy equipment. One is to uh, equip one of or more of your divisions with a maintenance company. And they can see as, as, as we uh, uh, capture an enemy division, I don't know, let's say with a thousand, uh, we wipe out an enemy division with a thousand infantry equipment, uh, capturing 5% of them, we will end up with 50 pieces of equipment to use for ourselves. So that's obviously a big advantage, especially when we're far away from home because it's you know it's it's a lot easier to pick up a gun that's just lying on the floor next to you as it is to wait for a delivery from thousands of miles away um and the other one is of course uh you've got one of those general traits that and let's take a look at for instance this field marshal here we go we've got this scavenger trait here uh buried within the engineer side of things and this gives an additional three percent uh, equipment capture ratio so again these bonuses stack and again if you've got expensive divisions offering uh, operating far from home definitely something worth looking at okay next one uh trickle back and war support protection this is entirely linked up with your field hospitals okay there may be some other modifiers within the game but it's primarily uh field hospitals so the game has a weird mechanic uh, i've been over it before but uh for the benefit of anybody new here when you have a division and they fight and we've been over some of the stats there with the hit points imagine the hit points gets knocked off and let's just keep you know, let's just use easy numbers. Let's say that we've got 100 people in our division. I realize that's uh, an unlikely figure, but let's just roll with it. If we lose 10 of those people, now we've got 90 left. The remaining 10 people to get our division back up to full strength have to come from home, from our surplus uh, or our recruitable population pool, which in this case is up there, 2.5 million just north. So our division is now operating below strength until those new guys show up when those new guys show up they've got no experience whatsoever they are they are fresh they're not even recruits they're just well they're fresh recruits day one they've not had no training whatsoever so they bring along zero experience so because our division may have some experience already you would hope so these new guys with no experience bring the overall level down so that right there would be cover the experience loss or the experience loss protection is perhaps a better way of saying it so what's trickle back then well instead of same situation we've got 100 guys we've lost 10 of them uh, in in combat rather than those 10 people being deleted off the game or killed if you like a certain percentage of them whatever the trickle back percentage is will magically reappear at the home base so if we you see, currently here, this division is set to 0% because we've not yet got field hospitals. So what? So for the purposes of this, let me just unlock a couple of these field hospitals. There we go, level 2. So now, same infantry division, we're going to go ahead and give ourselves a field hospital. Take a look at trickle back there. I realise it's partially obscured, so I'm just going to hover the mouse over so you get the tooltip. We've now got a 30% gain in trickle back. So... 100 people, 10 of them die, 
30% of those 10, or in other words, three people, are now going to magically reappear in this home pool at home. So we're going to run out of people less. In addition to that, the experience loss in this case is 25% less. So the higher the negative number, the better it is. And think of this more like it's analogous to we're going to patch somebody up and although they're not going to be able to fight for a few weeks, when they do come back, they're going to bring a lot of the experience back with them that they had from before. I realize you've sort of got to do a few mental gymnastics to explain away what you see here, but the upshot is in, in terms of the game, uh, rather than losing 100% of the experience for the people that were killed, you actually lose 75% in this case, because 25% of that experience is being protected. The higher the field hospital you level you get, the more experience you keep and the higher the amount of trickle back. In fact, if you unlock all the field hospitals, 50% of the people that are, quote, killed actually re magically reappear at home. So you may think, oh, well, 10 people, that's not much, whether you're losing two, three people or five people when you're talking two and a half million population. OK, but imagine it down the entire front where you've got a million, two, maybe even three million people fighting a war. If half of everybody that's killed is magically able to reappear, that's a good thing. And again, whatever mental gymnastics you like to square that away, that's what that stat is. Next one, then we're over to the combat stats. Soft attack and hard attack. Okay, so the way to view these two stats is in cahoots with every single division. So this division here is infantry is entirely soft. Yeah, there are, there are no tanks. So if you take a look at this particular slider here, if you hover the mouse, you can see that it's 100% um, soft. However, if we were to add in... Uh, let's just put in a medium tank battalion. Now you can see there's a little bit of hardness in there, and 9%. Yeah, the more bigger style tanks you add, the higher this is going to go. The fewer infantry divisions, the higher it's going to go. Okay, and if, if, if you went to some effort, you could balance it 50-50 or whatever that you like. So that right there is how hard a division is or how soft it is. And again, it's it's a balance on a sliding scale between 0 and 100%. It's either 0% hard or 100% hard, or, you know, and vice versa for soft. So soft attacks and hard attacks are how many attacks per hour you are inflicting versus each one of those uh, things. So, for example, this division, as I've currently got it, is going to inflict 120 attacks per hour against the division that it's attacking in the soft sense. So, in other words, if this division was now on the receiving end, as you can see, my division is 77% soft, 22% uh, hard. I'm able to defend 234 of those attacks. And again, some of those attacks are going to come against my soft guys. Those are the soft attacks. And some of the attacks are going to come against the, 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 the tanks or the hardness within my division. Mechanized infantry as well has some hardness to it. So those are the hard attacks. In other words, if you were to attack this division that I have now and only use hard attack, you would, no, you would only be able to defeat up to 22% of my division because 77% of this is soft still at this moment in time. And vice versa. So when it comes to attacking divisions or you're trying to defend, having this mix between soft and half, you've got to view it as almost two entirely separate things and you need to take care of both of them at the same time. And that's why there's this soft attack and hard attack. Now you may say, well, it's not always best to be the jack of all trades. Shouldn't you prioritize either soft or hard? Exactly, that's the best way to play. So to attack such a division effectively, you would actually have two separate divisions. You would have uh, a division, I don't know, you can have some tanks that specialize against uh, uh, infantry, such as the uh, the ground support artillery, uh, tanks with the, the, the artillery gun modifier, or anti-tank weapon on another division to go primarily for hard attack. And again, these two separate ways to attack is the most effective way of doing so. Again, these are attacks per hour. We've been over the defense per hour. So if this division was to attack itself, let's just assume we've got 120, let's just call it 160 in total. 
It's capable of defending itself 234 times per hour. In other words, we would never actually break through that defense, which means of all of these attacks that we're able to do, only 10% of them would ever actually hit and cause any damage against this particular division. Okay, coming over to the uh, air attack then. Very straightforward, the ability of a division to attack air. It doesn't just attack any air that happens to be flying over the top. It attacks air or combat air support that is attacking the division itself. So you've you've got like a Shnuka coming in to attack here. You've got a division here with an anti-air. And obviously, that you know, their, their objective is versus one another. You may have over here a high-flying strategic bomber that's on the way over uh, to do something miles away. The division here doesn't care and will not engage with that. However, if the enemy has a high amount of air superiority over an area and you have a lot of air attack, um, some of the bonuses that the enemy gains by having air superiority are negated by having air attack, even though you don't actually shoot them down. You just reduce some of the bonuses that they have or that you would have by having air superiority. Okay, breakthrough. Breakthrough is exactly the same as defense, except when you're on the attack. And to some people, this makes perfect sense. To other people, you think, what, eh? How can it be the same? And the answer is, just picture yourself as a, uh, as a, as a, as a guy or a, you're a squad of infantry, right? And your objective is to attack through the field in a straight line. So you're going that way, okay? So you're on the attack. Suddenly you get ambushed from your flank, whether it's the right flank, left flank, or maybe you're caught in crossfire, okay? You're unlikely to be able to pursue the attack across the field because you've got to duck down and deal with this attack coming at you from the side. Another way of saying that in this game is you have a low breakthrough or a low breakthrough ability, okay? So, well, what would have a higher breakthrough value then? Well, tanks, yeah? same sort of situation so if we remove these tanks here just to sort of demonstrate there's the breakthrough value without tanks 36.6 okay i'm not going to save this particular division but if i now just load up a, a a a light panzer division see the breakthrough here is 263 so we're talking many times higher well why would that be well same example you're in a tank driving through a field your objective is straight long you suddenly get ambushed by a few people shooting at you again, whether it's one side, the other, or both flanks. A tank doesn't really care that it's been shot at or attacked with machine gun fire. So if you want, you can just carry on going in a straight line. At least you can up to the tune of a breakthrough of 263. And again, what exactly does that number mean? It's how many attacks from the side per hour you can deal with before you're unable to continue advancing and you have to turn and deal with whatever the problem is. Armor. Okay. Armor and piercing in this game are directly linked with one another. So piercing is how good you are at getting through enemy armor, and armor is how good at you at stopping the enemy piercing. Whoever's got the highest number wins. Doesn't matter by how much. If their piercing ability is 31 and your armor is 30, you will lose. If your armor is 31.1, then even though it's only a tiny bit higher, you will still win. It's a yes or no, black or white answer. Can you do it or can't you? If you can pierce the enemy, there is a higher chance that you will inflict damage than if you can't. What exactly that chance is, I, I think it varies, but I was taking a look at a graph on the Paradox Wiki, and the upshot of all the mechanics behind the game seems to be roughly a 50% advantage. It's almost 50% at the end of the day. So if you're attacking an enemy tank division and you're able to pierce them, in other words, your piercing value here is higher than their armor. And if this division was attacking itself, you can see it would indeed be able to pierce itself. If that is the case... At the end of the day, we would inflict almost 50% more damage on that division than if the piercing was lower in this case. If our piercing was 9.8, we wouldn't be able to pierce our own division here. Initiative. Okay, so this is all to do with reinforcement in battle. So when you have um, a, a battle ongoing, let's see if we can find an example here. Um... 
I'm sure there was one that we clicked on first. There we go. So here, here, this particular battle is such an example. So we've got three divisions stuck into this fight. One, two, three against just one enemy division. They have none in reserve. We have one in reserve. Every single hour, there is a chance that our division here is going to be called up into battle. Again, it's not in reserve like, oh, they're sat there just chilling um, on the off chance. No, they're basically, they qualify for the battle. There's room for them. And we would like them in the battle, but there is a mechanic in the game that is preventing it. But there is an hourly chance every hour that they're going to get called up. Having higher initiative increases the chance or the probability. And if we take a look, if we hover the tooltip over there, as it happens with my current traits and everything, there is a 9% chance this particular division it's going to get called up on an hour by hour by hour basis. Okay, the sooner it gets stuck in, the sooner we've got four divisions fighting, you know, the more attack, the more defense, you know, the more everything that is good, the quicker the other guy is going to lose. So getting them called up out of reserve is a good thing. We take a look at there what, what modifies the 2% value base. Uh, having a radio plus 5%, so that's a huge advantage to have. Um, we currently are using or making use of the elastic fence doct doctrine so that's a gives us an additional two percent as well so and i think if i believe let's have a little look there was one other advantage to be had initiative oh also multi multiplies any coordination modifiers that you have which is when it comes to planning an attack. So if you plan an, 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 an attack before, so you you know you draw a front line, you draw a line to attack, and you don't press this button to go straight away, but you wait for a while. Um, if I just hover the tooltip over, you can see that on the very last line, you've got this plan preparation attack bonus. Now in my case, it's zero, because I didn't wait before doing the attack, I just hit go. Um, having a higher in initiative increases the bonus that you get there. What does that bonus actually do when it comes to attack? Well, it's exactly the same as entrenchment when you're on the defense. These are bonuses. Uh, entrenchment makes your defending abilities better. Uh, a plan preparation attack bonus makes your attack better. They're the same thing. So higher initiative is better when it comes to this bonus as well. Okay, next one. You may say, how much better? Um, I've seen examples of up to 70%, and maybe there are even greater examples. So imagine your one division going to cause 70% uh, more damage or defend 70% better. It's almost like having another division alongside it for free. So again, not something to overlook. Okay. Uh, entrenchment, like we said, is um, the... The, the opposite side of that so in this case this particular division is able to entrench itself to a, a, a up to 3.7 as this calls it and there are the reasons why infantry as well as the engineer company uh, some units uh, obviously much less such as the tanks by default uh, entrenchments in this case just down to two and again that's based on those engineers Entrenchment, like we said, gives you bonuses when the division is entrenched and somebody attacks them. The bonuses are not just for defense, but also for attacks. Remember, when somebody comes to attack you and you are entrenched, it's not just a case of, well, you've got to defend and that's it. You're also shooting back. So the bonuses go for both defense as well as attack while you're in the entrenched position. Uh, so... The more you can entrench, the better it is. So that's that one, or the, or the, the higher the benefits. Exactly how much uh, I'm not, you know, what is 3.8 in terms of percentage gain in battle? Uh, I couldn't tell you other than to say the highest that I've seen people talk about is 70%. But again, if somebody can find a higher example, you know, please do share it. Equipment capture ratio. Okay, so by default, every division has an equip equipment capture ratio of zero. This, again, if you're far away from base, we've been over this, is uh, not necessarily a good thing. Again, the two ways to get it, you get a general with some equipment capture traits. And I think we saw there that one example. 
uh, with the Field Marshal, I believe it was, given equipment capture ratio of 3%. So the great thing about equipment capture is you've constantly got attrition. You know, whether you're winning or losing doesn't matter. There is this constant uh, rate of equipment attrition or loss. All of that's got to be replaced from the capital. If, however, you find suitable equipment laying on the floor, you will make use of that first. If you have a full supply of equipment and there is still stuff on the floor, that stuff will get picked up and actually sent over to somebody else that needs it. But if nobody needs it, it will actually go back to your capital uh, to stock up supplies, which you can either use if things turn south later on, or um, especially if you've got some of the DLC, you can actually take enemy equipment that you've captured and sell it on the international market. Combat width, I've dedicated an entire episode just to the subject of combat width. There's quite a bit to it. Uh, I will endeavour to leave a link to it in the description. If I forget to do so, uh, please holler at me and I will make sure that is done. So the next final column are these miscellaneous stats. And these sometimes vary depending on which type of division you've selected. Exactly what kind of units or battalions make up the division. So attrition, and again, this is a modifier attrition. So uh, if we find somebody who is stuck in, uh, perhaps is this guy. There we go. So for instance, this particular division here has 9% attrition. And here's why. So currently this battle is being fought in the height of the summer, 39. And so you can see one of the problems that this division is facing is the heat. Because it's very hot, there's an increase in the total amount of attrition. And so you can see the breakdown there. Um, you can see the reliability of various pieces of equipment. And again, having something that is expensive to replace, such as heavy tanks, you don't really want to lose those uh, if you can help it. In this case, we've uh, selected this Panzer Division or Light Panzer Division. You can see there they've got the same issues when it comes to heat and so on. So... In, to improve uh, the amount of attrition, or let's say to have less attrition, which is an improvement, the only real thing you can do is, again, research new and better technology and get that equipment out, as well as get the maintenance company uh, involved. And again, this is uh, uh, tied very closely with the average reliability and the re uh, reliability bonus. Obviously, things... So as, as well that affect attrition are the terrain types. So driving over a desert, for example, will cause you to lose more stuff than, say, be at home uh, over nice green or lush green terrain in normal weather, should we say. Uh, weather as well, speaking of which, has an impact. The very worst of which is actually desert dust storm. You can have dust storms. That causes the most amount of attrition in the game. Uh, you've got thunderstorms and so on. They cause a little bit of additional attrition. I think it's something like 10%, although they do affect aircraft a little bit more. Weight. This is entirely... Basically doesn't matter to you unless you're using convoys. So the heavier a division weighs in its weight, the more convoys you will require when you're moving a division from here to there. Now... That will not matter unless you start running out of convoys. So in this case, if we take a look here, we currently have 200 convoys. If you see there in stockpiles, we're using 11 of them for whatever the reason is. OK, so if we were to plan an invasion, for example, or just simply move uh, divisions around without an invasion order, you would require and they would basically earmark those convoys for the planning as well as for the duration of what you're doing. So the heavier something is, the more convoys are used up. So if you've got a lot of heavy divisions and you're short on convoys, that is about the only time to worry about it. Fuel capacity, last but not least, as well as the fuel usage, of course, uh, are linked with one another. The fuel usage is in terms of per hour. And again, I, I like to uh, refer to this as tons when we're talking fuel. So this division here, this Panzer division, assuming that it's moving around doing its thing, is going to use 14.4 tons of fuel per hour. Now, if we're near a supply hub, that doesn't matter. If we venture away from the supply hub, the fuel capacity is going to begin draining. And again, we this division is able to hold almost 700 tons of fuel. And if we're using, well, the best part of 15 tons of fuel per hour, what's that? 15, 
Uh, what's that? About ish, uh, three, three to four hundred tons of fuel per day or per twenty-four hour period. So, if we were to go away from a supply hub, just very rough and ready maths, this division would be able to function effectively for almost, if not around, two days' time. Okay, sure, somebody's got a precise figure in their head, but I'm going to say it's roughly two days. So if this division needs to fight any longer, you need to find some ways of getting supplies to this division, or it's going to grind down really, really slow. Uh, it's not that they can't move at all, but they're basically less than walking pace, so it's uh, imperative that uh, you keep them supplied. So I think right there, we've rounded it up. <laughs> I was expecting there to be one more, um, but... Oh yeah, let's have a look. Let's just have a look on the trucks again for fuel. So same thing there. You can see this one actually would last a, a little longer. Uh, less fuel used per hour. Uh, fuel capacity there. Again, that makes sense, right? Lorries use less fuel than tanks. All right, I hope you found the video useful. And until next time from me here on the Games of Brains channel, Hearts of Iron 4 stuff. Take care to wrap.